Okay, so let's talk about identification analysis of the parameters in your DSG model and how you can do that with Dynair. Maybe first a clarification. I'm concerned here about the identifiability of the model parameters and not about identifying a certain shock like a monetary policy shock like you would do in a structural VR analysis. So this is really about whether or not the model dynamics are different for distinct parameter values or parameter combinations. So let me give you an example. Say you have two monetary policy rules. One is very hawkish and the other one is very dovish. So the, ha the hawkish one, you have one calibration where the central bank reacts very strongly, very aggressively to inflation deviations and does not really care about output gap deviations. So you have a very high value for the infla inflation coefficient, but a very low level for the output gap coefficient. And then you have another calibration where there's a dovish reaction, a very balanced reaction to inflation deviations and output gap deviations. So the inflation coefficient has a moderate value and also the output gap coefficient has also a moderate value. And you might run into an identification problem where those two calibrations, those two very different policy rules will give you the exact same model dynamics, the exact same moments, the exact same impulse response functions, the exact same variance decompositions. Okay, this is what I'm concerned about. This is the parameter identification problem. So first, let me give you some more motivation why uh, studying this uh, is uh, important. Now, first of all, Bayesian and also to some extent frequentist estimation of uh, modern DSG models has rapidly progressed in the last uh, decades. Um, nowadays, um, due to software like Dynair, it is very easy and it's very straightforward to estimate a model with modern state-of-the-art techniques um, without being an expert on those techniques. But if you remember your your basic econometrics uh, education, say for, for maximum likelihood or generalized method of moments, there were always those, um, those cryptic regularity conditions. And if you're like me, uh, you most likely uh, just skip those. However, if you really look into these, then you will often find that parameter identification belongs to those regularity conditions. So you really need to check this before doing any estimation. And often the, the study of identifiability of parameters, which really should precede the estimation of parameters, is still a rather neglected topic in applied macro. And in this presentation, in this talk, I will try to present you some diagnostics you can use that are built in in Dynair exactly for this purpose, even before taking your model to data. And I will also argue that you can think about identification of parameters as a model property. So similar to, to the choice of utility function or to which shocks I include in the model or which frictions I include in the model. All those choices influence the identification properties of your parameters. So this becomes also a model property. And this will be different for every model. So if you decide to add an additional feature, this might change the identification property of your model. It also depends which variables you declare as observables. So many things that you as a researcher can do that can influence identification of parameters and um, Dynair offers a toolbox that you can assess this on a case by case basis. And this toolbox has uh, many state of the art diagnostics and tests um, to basically detect two kinds of identification failures. First is what I call theoretical identification failures. That is, there is no way that even with an infinite sample, there is no way that you can identify a parameter or a combination of parameters because, uh, for instance, those parameters don't um, influence the dynamics of your model at all, don't influence the moments of your model at all. Or there's a parameter that offsets another parameter. So if this value is high and this is low, this is the same as uh, the other way around. So this is what I call theoretical identification failure. On the other hand, there's also the, the strength of identification or weakly identified parameters. So how well can you actually estimate the parameters? How precisely? So in a sense, how small becomes your variance with a growing sample size or how large becomes the precision you can estimate this parameter with a growing sample size. So this is also concerned about uh, small sample issues here. 
And as always, the literature has progressed and keeps progressing and um, we will try to keep up and this toolbox will most likely include several other diagnostics as well in the near future. And as Dynair is open source, feature requests, but also contributions are very welcome. So please feel free to get involved. And let's first have a look at the shape of a likelihood. So here you can see a nicely behaved uh, likelihood. So this shows a clear peak in rho and sigma w. So say my optimization technique will most likely uncover this, uh, this maximum. And due to this nice curvature, the estimates of my standard errors will benefit from this nice curvature. Now, but have a look at uh, two other parameters. Here, the likelihood function has no unique maximum, right? There's only a range of maxima. So I have a problem here, especially if I want to estimate and standard errors, think about the strength of identification. Now let me give you another example from time series analysis. Okay, so consider an AMA11 process. So there's one lag in the endogenous variable x and one lag in the exogenous variable epsilon. And this epsilon is drawn from a normal distribution with standard error sigma and mean zero. So let us simply simulate data for this model and let's do this in Dynair. I have one endogenous variable x, one exogenous variable E, two parameters, theta one and theta two, and the model is simply the AMA one one. And in steady state, of course, x is zero. So I've created a dot ink. Um, so these are my common model equations and I'm including this with Dynair's macro preprocessing language. Now, let me set those two parameters equal to each other, okay? And consider a unit shock. So let me simulate 150 periods and drop the first 50. And then I'm having a look at uh, X and E. Okay, so let's do Dynair Arma plots. And you can see this figure here. And really have a close look. Don't they look the same? Is that so? Okay, let me check. Is OO underscore EXO symbol, those are my shocks. Are those equal? Yes, they are. Okay, let me try a different parameter combination, say 0 0.3 and 0 0.3. Let's do again, armor plots. And again, they're completely equal. Okay, so this is always the same as epsilon. So what is going on here? Now imagine this is your data set. I mean, there's no way you can pinpoint whether the model parameters are both 0 0.5 or 0 or 0 0.3. All these values give you the exact same data, the exact same model structure. So what is going on here? Now, let's have a look. Um, remember that a Gaussian process is completely characterized by its first two moments. So let's have a look at this. The first moment of x here is zero. For the second moment, we can actually compute the covariance and the out covariance function in closed form. Um, and this is a function of the model parameters phi one, phi two, and of sigma. Okay, very importantly, the out covariances, the moments are a function of the underlying structural parameters phi one, phi two, and sigma. Now, what it happens if I set those coefficients equal to each other? Um, let's see, we get that the variance is equal to sigma squared and all out covariances become zero. And actually this is the same covariance or out covariance function of the white noise process, which I can get if I set theta one equal to zero and theta two also equal to zero, then x is equal to epsilon. So these processes are all the same. And for estimation, this means that whenever those two parameters are equal, there is a theoretical identification problem because there is an infinite amount of other parameter combinations that give you the exact same moments. But this is only true if those parameters are equal. If one is not equal to, to the other, then those are identifiable. And also sigma is identified. Let's have a look whether or not Dynair's toolbox also gives me this result. Okay, I'm including again the model equations and I'm using 
those two values, setting them equal to each other. And then I have to declare an observable variable and simply running the identification command. Okay, so let's do this. Arma, let's call this Arma identif. And you see a bunch of output identification analysis. Some tests couldn't be performed, but others could be performed. And you see that here, for instance, as we were looking at the moments, the moments, the rank of the Jacobian of first two moments is deficient. Those two parameters are pairwise collinear. So you would need to fix one of these parameters to identify the other one. Okay, and this is also visible from parameter Jacobian of the theoretical spectral density. Okay, what about, what if we change this value to 0 0.4? Then we see that all parameters are actually identified. Okay, so you can see that Dynair's toolbox will indicate that there's something wrong with your model. Okay, now let me give you another example, a forward-looking DSGE model. So consider a very basic canonical three equation New Keynesian model. So there's a Taylor rule for the nominal interest rate and a monetary policy shock, a dynamic IS curve uh, for the output gap X and a demand shock EPSD, and the New Keynesian Phillips curve and a cost push or supply shock epsilon S. So let's put these three equations in a matrix. Uh, so you get a zero times the vector of endogenous variables at period T is equal to a one times the vector of endogenous variables at period T plus one, or the expectation of this vector, plus the vector of exogenous variables. And now let's assume that we have parameters such that we can take the inverse of a zero. Okay, then the solution to the rational expectations problem would imply that the, the eigenvalues of the inverse of a zero times a one must all lie within the unit circle. So we don't have explosive behavior. We can solve this then such that the um, endogenous variables are a function of the exogenous value variables. So this is basically our policy function here. Okay, now let's have a closer look at the the inverse of a zero. And let's see, for instance, whether or not all parameters are actually in this inverse or not. You know, beta is, for instance, missing. So there are a couple of issues here that I want to go over. Um, so some typical identification failures. Well, first of all, um, there is a determinacy and stability region. Uh, that is not all parameter combinations give you a unique and stable saddle path. And those restrictions that ensure those regularity, that is those, those eigenvalues uh, are inside the unit circle, um, create actually bounds on, on, on parameters. So for instance, uh, there, there are bounds on beta and the value of beta also influences bounds of other parameters. And in the Bayesian literature, this is often known as a non-variation free parameter sp space. Now let me go back to identification failures. As I was saying, I don't see beta anymore in the solution, in the inverse here. Okay, so even though the value of beta is very important for the existence of the solution, so whether or not uh, the eigenvalues of the inverse of a zero times a one all lie within the unit circle, it does not really enter the solution. So it does not influence anything I do with the solution, whether or not I simulate data from this or compute impulse response functions or estimate the model based on this reduced form. There is no way I can pinpoint beta. Of course, we also have the slope of the new Keynesian Phillips curve kappa. That is al already a composite parameter of a, of a bunch of other parameters, uh, depending on whether or you, you're working with, with Calvo or Rotenberg type nominal rigidities. So there are hidden parameters that I might not be able to identify, but just this composite parameter kappa. Now, identification depends on the choice of observables. Okay, so for instance, when I only observe xt, so this is the, just the second row, there are different combinations of parameters that will give me the exact same values here in, uh, in the second row. For instance, tau and kappa are pairwise collinear, 
kappa and psi are pairwise collinear. Only if I fix one value, say for instance psi, then tau and kappa are uniquely determined. Okay, so there are not an infinite amount of combinations of tau and kappa that will give me the exact same solution here. Okay, now let's have a look how this works in Dynair. Okay, so I have my endogenous variables Rx and P, my exogenous uh, variables, those are the, the shocks, and the four parameters I'm concerned about. This is the calibration, so the Taylor principle is given here. So the Taylor principle is fulfilled. And the model equations. Let's use uh, unit variance for all shocks. And using an estimated params block, I can actually tell Dynair which parameters I'm concerned about. Okay, because by default it will consider all parameters and all standard errors of parameters. I I'm really just want to focus on these. So let's go ahead and run this. And you can see that given the spectrum, some tests uh, were not able to be computed, but this, for instance, tells you that beta is not identified, as we will saw just in theory, and that those two combinations of parameters are pairwise collinear. Now, if I would fix this parameter, okay, so let's um, redo this, then there's only beta not identified. Okay, let's re-include this. What if I assume that all variables are observable? Var, uh, I call this var ops all. This also provides you means to identify more parameters in your model. So we've seen only observing, uh, observing x yields additional problems in identifying all parameters of the model. But for instance, if I'm able to observe all model variables, then some of those issues um, are resolved, but not the beta one, because it does not enter the solution at all. So um, is there a general rule about observables? And unfortunately, the answer is no. So um, here we've seen that being able to observe all variables is of course uh, the best option you can do. Uh, but this is not realistic at all in practice um, because uh, due to data limitation um, or often we need to transform our model variables to match variables that we can actually observe in data. Also some estimation techniques require you to have the same number of observables as the number of shocks. So there are many trade-offs and limitations that you face. And there is, there is no real general rule uh, which observables are best. Again, this is a model property and different combinations of observables influence the identification of parameters. We do have another toolbox, the so-called Dynair Sensitivity Toolbox that gives you um, intuition and insight which parameters are most important for driving the dynamics uh, or the moments or the impulse response functions or the variance decompositions of which variable. So which parameter is most important for which variable. So this is maybe one way to go to get a feeling which variables you should choose as observables. And alternatively, I mean, if you have like three shocks and there's only six variables that you really can find the data for, then why not you simply use brute force approach and try out all different combinations and see whatever works best. Okay, let me give you yet another example. This one is concerned about investment adjustment costs. Okay, so this is a standard RBC model with a log utility, Cobb Douglas production function, and an AR1 TFP process. But we do have two kinds of investment adjustment costs. Um, first, it is costly to transform consumption goods into investment goods. So in other words, there are so-called multi-sectoral uh, adjustment costs in aggregate demand, and this is governed by this parameter, theta. Now, second, uh, investment cannot be transformed directly one-to-one -one into uh, capital. So there are intertemporal adjustment costs uh, governed by this parameter kappa in the capital accumulation equation. So now let me simulate this model and have a look at the theoretical moments for different parameterizations of kappa and theta in Dynair. 
again, I've created a common .inc file with all the model equations and um, specifications that are used in those different mode files here. So the variables are defined here. Uh, the, there's one exogenous variable. These are the parameters, so the discount factor, the annual steady state rate interest rate that actually defines the discount factor. Um, so quite standard RBC model here. But there are also this theta and kappa. Those are the adjustment cost parameters. Okay, so um, then um, I'm using, I'm targeting steady state values and I'm using the, the steady state values to compute analytically the values of the parameters here. And then the model equations are given by these equations here. Okay. The steady state can be computed analytically as I'm doing here. And there's one shock, I assume unit variance. And then again, I'm specifying priors or specify uh, parameters which you want to check identification for using an estimated params block. Okay, and here I'm actually um, specifying a whole prior distribution because we can not only check identification for just one point, but maybe draw a thousand points and check for each of this point and this drawing then stems from identification. But we will go over this later. Okay, now let's set theta and kappa to these two values and let's uh, compute um, or let's solve the model and have a look at the theoretical moments here. Okay, here you can see the theoretical moments. And let me copy these over here. Now, let me shut off the um, multi-sectoral investment adjustment costs and let me use this value kappa of 1.4 here. Okay, so dynair invest adjust no multi costs. Oops. And let me have a look again at the theoretical moments. And now compare these. Okay, the mean exactly the same. Of course, this is the steady state. But have a look at the variance and order standard deviation. It's exactly the same except for lambda and for q. But all other variances and standard deviations, all other second moments, are exactly the same even though we have two different parameterizations. And let me give you yet another parameterization where I'm using a negative value for theta and I'm shutting off intertemporal investment adjustment costs. And let me compare this again. And we have the same picture here, okay? Except for lambda and q, those are this is the Lagrange multiplier, which corresponds to marginal utility, and Q is Tobin's Q, basically. Um, all those second moments and first moments are all the same. So you can see that those very different parameterizations that correspond to very different models, in economic terms, of course, all give you the same first two moments for all endogenous variables, except the Lagrange multiplier lambda and Tobin's Q. No, this is not good. So you have an obvious identification problem. So again, let us see whether Daniel's toolbox can also detect this issue. So let us consider the, the baseline parameterization here. Um, I need to select observable variables. Let's assume that we know consumption and investment. And I want to focus on the calibration and not the prior mean, for instance. So I'm at the calibrated value values. So when you can see that all identification tests tell you that kappa and theta are pairwise collinear, but they also tell you that another parameter is not identified, R A. And what is happening here? Well, if you have a look at, we've, we declared both beta and R A, 
and then in the calibration I use RA to set the value of beta and RA does not enter the model equations at all except it sets the value for beta. Beta does enter the model equations. So this is a very typical example of a so-called endogenous parameter. So one parameter determines the value of another one. And the discount factor is actually a very prominent example that we find in many uh, mode files. Okay, now let me assume that I can also observe the marginal utility, lambda. Okay, let's see what happens. All right, we can solve this theta and kappa problem, but not the RA problem here. But is observing lambda um, realistic? Most likely not. Okay, so we have seen that theta and kappa are jointly non-identifiable. Kim uh, shows in his paper that all theta and kappa combinations that will give you the same value here are observational equivalent. And the toolbox is able to detect this. When observing lambda here as well, then we can solve this. So observing this Lagrange multiplier or Tobin's Q provide additional restrictions to identify these parameters uh, separately. But I still get this RA problem and we have seen that this is a very typical failure that we see in many mode files that this is an action endogenous parameters. I actually write such parameters inside the model block of your Dynair mode file using those model local variables, so those hashtags. So in this case, I would not declare beta as a parameter, but RA as a parameter and use hashtag beta in my model block. Okay, so what insights did we uh, get from this exercise here? First of all, different parameters yield the same theoretical moments and therefore also the same model dynamics like input response functions. The reason is that the first order perturbation solution is actually a linear Gaussian state space system. So like in the ARMA11 example, the first two moments characterize the whole distribution, all higher order moments, all impulse response functions, all variance decompositions, etc. Everything is based on those moments. That is, even with an infinite sample size, there is no way that you can recover, that you can uniquely recover the true model structure. So even with an infinite sample size, there is no way to uniquely recover the true model structure. So do I, do I have both investment adjustment costs or do I have only multi-sectoral investment adjustment costs or only intertemporal investment adjustment costs? All those model structures are observational equivalent. Okay, so let's tackle this issue in a more systematic way and cover both some theoretical as well as practical issues. Now, in theory, we are concerned about the mapping between the structural parameters and some objective function, whether this mapping is unique or in mathematical terms is injective. Um, if not, then structural models with uh, very different economic interpretations may be indistinguishable. So this is what we then call observational equivalence. Under identification can also happen if the objective function is independent of certain structural parameters. That is because they uh, disappear from the rational expectation solution. Um, consider my forward-looking DSG model, the beta there. Now there's also partial identification issues with say two or more structural parameters that enter the objective function, but only proportionally. So making them separately unrecoverable. Okay, so think about the example with the investment adjustment cost parameters or the ARMA11 example. But of course there's also weak identification, that is even though parameters might be theoretically identified, they enter the objective but the curvature is very small, maybe in certain regions of the parameter space. And what does this mean in practice? So first of all, lack of identification leads to wrong conclusions from calibration, from estimation and inference. And you will typically run into many issues when say optimizing your objective functions. Uh, those errors you typically get in the air of say not well behaved Hessians are just one example that it is difficult to maximize say the likelihood or the posterior or minimize some moments distance objective function when you 
include unidentified parameters. Also often the, estimate, the estimators lie on the boundary of the theoretical admissible space. And this is quite hard, particularly for Gaussian asymptotic theory, this will yield very poor approximations and also for numerical algorithms. And in many cases, these issues that arise are due to identifiability issues or an unfortunate choice of observables. For maybe applied researchers, weak identification is likely a, a much more serious concern as this is dependent on the sample size and actual data you, you have. So having some idea on which parameters you can actually estimate precisely uh, and which you cannot is very useful. So what about the Bayesians out there? Um, and you will often hear them say that unidentifiability causes no real difficulties in the Bayesian approach. The idea is if you have non-identified parameters, simply put a prior on that and you're fine. Uh, this will not matter for your posterior. And I have to disagree here, uh, particularly in practice, uh, because this prior becomes extremely influential and needs to be very informative for a proper posterior. Also, if you compare priors and posteriors uh, for non-identified parameters, they can be very misleading. Okay? You might suspect that there is some learning from data uh, when there's actually none because this parameter is not identified. And again, in my experience, those numerical algorithms, those MCMC algorithms, really struggle in this case. So if I estimate a model with theoretically non-identified parameters, I run into many numerical issues. If I fix those issues, then the MCMC runs smoothly. And one other reason we saw with the uh, forward-looking model is that the parameter space is not variation-free. This involves the region of other parameters. Now, is there a systematic way to detect such issues? Yes, and with Dynair, you have a comprehensive toolbox to do so. But let me first be uh, a bit more precise uh, what we're talking about. So first, what is again theoretical lack of identification? This means that distinct parameter values do not lead to distinct objective functions of data. And here the objective functions are typically probability distributions, uh, the likelihood, the posterior or some moments distance. And we want a unique mapping, an injective mapping, if you're familiar with that term. So basically, if I change my parameters a bit, I want to see changes in the objective. Okay, and if I change parameters and nothing happens with my objective, then I, this mapping is not unique. Or if I change several parameters and they sort of offset each other, nothing changes back here at the, in my objective, then again, this mapping is not unique. Now let's define global and local identification. First, uh, some um, notation here. Uh, theta is the vector of model parameters. Uh, capital theta is the admissible parameter space, which gives you a unique and stable solution. Y um, capital T is the matrix of observables with sample size uh, capital T. And this P is a function of your data and of your parameters. This is the objective function generated by my DSG model. So let me uh, now define global and local identification in the, in the sense of Rotenberg. So a point theta zero in the admissible parameter space is said to be globally identified if for all my data, the probability distribution of two different points can only be equal to each other if those two points are equal. Okay, so this is a basic definition of injectivity. If this is only true for values in an open neighborhood of theta zero, then theta zero is said to be locally identified. Okay, here the difference is, is this only locally in the neighborhood of this parameter I'm interested, or do I also have other parameters quite far away from this that will give me the same value of the objective function. So basically we formalize injectivity of the mapping. And in the literature from the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, where the, the groundbreaking work has taken place, this was analyzed by computing the Jacobians of those objective functions with respect to the parameters of interest. And then we check whether these Jacobians have full rank. So basically this is a very general approach to prove injectivity. And this is also what we do in the toolbox here. 
Now, of course, applied researchers are much more concerned about the strength of identification. So how much information can be extracted from a specific data set or a specific sample size to estimate the parameters precisely? So we, we basically want the, the variance of the parameters to be low, or in other words, the precision to be very high. And we can measure for weak identification, for instance, with the, the rate at which the precision improves for growing sample size. And uh, say, for instance, if you have a theoretically non-identified parameter, the precision or the variance will always stay the same, independent of the sample size. For a well-identified uh, parameter, it will update uh, at, the, at the speed, at the rate of the sample size. Okay, so this is uh, a notion of how to think about the strength of identification. Now let's have a brief look in the literature on identification in these G models. So first, there are two approaches to tackle global identification by either minimizing the kalbeck leibler discrepancy or exploiting the link between observational equivalent state space representations and model solution constraints. These approaches, however, are numerically quite challenging uh, and somewhat hard to, to generalize, uh, but I'm actually working on extending uh, the identification toolbox to include uh, exactly these two methods. Now, what about local identification? Here we basically have three approaches um, that you can find in the literature um, developed particularly for linearized Gaussian DSG models. Okay, so they are based on the idea of checking the rank of Jacobian matrices, so very similar to the classical literature on identification. So you look either at the Jacobian of the theoretical moments or the Jacobian of the spectral density or use results from control theory for minimal, um, for minimal systems to set up a Jacobian of restrictions and check whether this is full rank. And currently, Dynair supports all of these uh, three diagnostics. Uh, however, there are so several numeral settings that sometimes yield slightly different results between these uh, diagnostics. Uh, in my personal experience, I find that the moments identification check is less prone to the numer numerical settings chosen, whereas the spectral density approach is somewhat sensitive uh, to this, particularly how you compute the rank. Uh, and the um, approach based on minimal systems is actually very sensitive to the numerical settings. But actually, in most cases, they all indicate uh, the same parameters. Uh, so don't worry if they differ slightly. You do get an indication which parameters might be problematic here. Now, um, I have actually extended these uh, methods for both nonlinear and or non-Gaussian DSG models based on Jacobians of cumulants and polyspectra, which is some, some generalization of uh, moments and spectral density. And I will present this approach a bit later in this talk. And also you could uh, extend the approach on a minimal systems by including simply additional restrictions, like for instance, um, the mean corrections and higher order approximations. Uh, currently Dynair supports uh, these new methods here for um, models solved with perturbation at orders two and three. Uh, with the pruning option. Dynair doesn't support any non-Gaussian distribution yet, even though these diagnostics are developed for to, to handle these cases as well. Um, you can do this uh, right now with Dynair, but maybe in the future we will also introduce some uh, non-Gaussian distribution. Now, what about the literature on weak identification? Um, there are several indicators, and I'm probably not doing uh, a good uh, review here. So the first indicator is uh, actually based on the asymptotic information matrix, and this can be computed either analytically or via simulation. And this is already built in into Dynair, and I will cover this um, in this video. The Bayesian indicator of uh, Coop, Passeran, and Smith is based on estimating your model on simulated data sets of growing sample sizes and um, taking track of how the precision updates on growing sample sizes. And actually I'm currently working on including an automatic version of this to the identification toolbox, but this is still work in progress. But you, you can very simply do this um, by hand. And then there are some other approaches here of uh, say comparing your DSG model um, dynamics with a VAR approximation 
or looking at the um, Gaussian likelihood, one can derive a score type test that indicates weak identification. So these two approaches um, uh, cannot are not built in into Dynair, but they can but they can uh, be easily replicated using Dynair. But I will not talk about this in this video. Now let's have a closer look and identification checks in linearized DSG models where the shocks stem from the normal distribution. So Dynair's first order perturbation approximation is given in this OO underscore DR structure, in particular those GHX and GHU matrices. Um, so all endogenous variables you declared are basically, um, have a basically a linear law of motion um, given by this GHX matrix times the state variables of your model plus GHU times the shocks. And one can uh, reorganize the, the variables uh, to get a maybe a more familiar ABCD representation uh, of a state space system. And so here X denotes my state variables and Y denotes the subset of endogenous variables that is observable. So what you declare with var ops. Now note that because U is Gaussian, so is X and so is Y and so is Z. Okay, and this is very convenient because all the information that we can use for identification or estimation is actually stacked, is contained in the first two moments of our observables. And also this linear Gaussian state space system, this is immensely studied uh, in the literature and you, you, may, you might be familiar, for instance, the literature on the Kalman filter. Uh, which provides means to precisely and quickly evaluate, say, the likelihood in such models in closed form, which is so great for estimating um, your model with full information methods. So this is basically why we love first order approximations, I think. Uh, but we'll get back to this later on, why it might be a good idea to deviate from this linear Gaussian state space system. But for now, just remember everything is contained in the first two moments. Now, these Moments can be computed analytically uh, in closed form where the um, covariance matrix can be solved by either using the inverse of a large Kronecker product or some uh, very efficient and very precise algorithm for Lyapunov equations, which is, which is what we do in, by default in Dynair. Now, having these uh, moments, we can then go ahead and compute the theoretical autocovariogram uh, remember my armor 11 example here. Um, we can also transform those second moments into the frequency domain by computing the transfer function. Um, so we can then compute the spectral density also in closed form. Um, there is some approximation in the for computing the integral though, but basically this uh, can be done very precisely. And also Dynair's state space system is typically not of minimal size, but there are procedures to find the smallest dimension of the state vector to get the so-called minimal state space system um, by say numerical pole canceling techniques, for instance. However, the uh, minimal state representation you get or the minimal states you get uh, don't really have an economic meaning, but are interesting to tackle identification issues. Now some remarks. Um, as we only have data on our observables, this is generally insufficient to fully characterize the distribution of the state variables and other endogenous variables. But our model implies restrictions through, uh, through theta on the ABCD matrices. And this mapping is, however, highly uh, nonlinear and typically unknown. Um, but it is given implicitly and we can evaluate it, we can compute it via the implicit function theorem. Um, either in closed form or even numeric or numerically. Okay, so now let us have a look at a diagnostic based on moments. Here the idea is if I change my parameters or a combination of parameters, I want my moments to change as well. So if I change one parameter or a couple of parameters, the moments here should also change. And I want this mapping from the structural parameters to the data to be unique. Now let's formalize this. The vector m here includes the mean covariance and all of the covariances of uh, up to some order q of our observables. Now given some assumptions on differentiability and continuity and on the value of theta, um, we can then have a look at the Jacobian of m with respect to model parameters theta. 
If this Jacobian has full column rank, then the parameters are locally identifiable. Say, so if there is a actually column of zeros, then we know that the parameter corresponding to this column does not influence the moments at all. So think about the beta, my, my forward looking DSG model example. If there are parameters that are linearly dependent, um, so they are linearly dependent columns, those uh, parameters corresponding to those columns are jointly not identifiable. So think about my investment adjustment costs um, example. Now, if there are highly correlated columns, this might also indicate that there might be even other dependencies or issues with those parameters as well. So you should be aware of that. Now, again, what is the intuition here? I want the mapping to be unique. So I need to mathematically check injectivity by looking at the rank of the Jacobian matrix. And this then gives me an order condition. So I need at least as many moments uh, as parameters. Uh, I, I have this rank condition. So a full rank means identified parameters. And this is very helpful in detecting um, observational equivalence. So those columns of zeros, those linear dependent, uh, dependencies between parameters. Now, uh, what about global identification with this indicator? Um, theoretically, this is not possible, but in practice, we can, of course, um, do a poor man's global identification check by simply running the local identification check for a relevant uh, range of parameters. Okay, we can also decompose this Jacobian of moments. So um, first we take the derivative with respect to, to tau. Tau is, are the reduced form parameters. Uh, that is uh, the ABCD matrix matrices or this GHX and GHU and the sigma U. So taking the derivative of the moments with respect to tau is actually a sensitivity of observed data moments to changes in the model solution. But more interestingly, how does the model solution change when I change my parameters? So this is the se sensitivity of the model solution to changes in the model parameters. Okay, and this is what we also uh, print out in Dynair. This is the Jacobian of the reduced form. So a point theta zero is locally identifiable if this Jacobian at theta zero has full rank. Note though that this is only a necessary but not a sufficient condition um, unless you assume that all your variables are observed. Now going from the time domain to the frequency domain, uh, means basically I can transform the whole set of unconditional second moments into the spectral density. And here again, the idea is if I change my parameters, I want to see changes in the spectral density as well. So if I want, if I change one parameter, there should be changes here. If I change a bunch of parameters or combination of parameters, I want to see changes. If there are no changes, then those parameters are not identified. So let's formalize this. Um, so basically we'll compute here the Jacobian of the mean with respect to the parameters. And we add the Jacobian of the spectral density with respect to the parameters. Actually, we're not computing this uh, matrix here, but we compute a gram matrix of this. Okay, so the transpose multiplied with, with the matrix itself. And then we check whether this G bar matrix is full rank. Now having this gram matrix structure here is very uh, useful because the dimension here is number of parameters times number of parameters. So to pinpoint the relevant parameters, one can then either look at say all combinations of sub matrices, uh, whether these are full rank, but this might be somewhat time consuming. And by default, we also rely on null space techniques, uh, which are quicker, but sometimes give you slight numerical inconsistencies with this criteria. And then my advice is actually to do the uh, brute force check. Now the intuition here again is I want the mapping from the parameters to the spectral density to be injective. And I check this by computing the rank of a Jacobian matrix. And due to this gram matrix uh, structure, we don't have an order condition, but a rank condition. So full rank means identified parameters. Again, this is not a global identification method, but we could do a poor man's global identification check 
by running um, this uh, local identification diagnostic on draws, say, from, from the prior distribution of, of relevant par parameter values. Now, this approach is typically slower as the moments approach because here I need to compute an integral, I need to approximate this integral, and this might take a while depending on your choice of uh, grid points. But note that if your model is identified with just a few grid points, then it will always be also identified with much more uh, grid points. Now, the last um, diagnostic I want to present um, is actually based on something that has been done in the in the 60s, um, uh, where people have studied in depth this linear Gaussian state space system and all the identification properties, how to uh, derive restrictions based on uniqueness of transfer functions and spectral densities, how to then derive restrictions in Jacobians and then compute the ranks of these Jacobians. In the DSG literature, there's a slight difficulty because we're not really concerned about this ABCD matrices, but we have those structural parameters that map into this reduced form. Uh, so we have an additional uh, mapping there. We need to carefully disentangle uh, because this is typically only given numerically and not in closed form. Now, first let me um, briefly um, explain what a minimal system is. So basically you look for the smallest possible dimension of the state vector that drives the dynamics of your model. And there's an exact definition of minimality. You need to check for controllability, that is for any initial state, it is always p possible to design an input sequence that puts the system in the desired final state. Then there's also the observability condition that is given the evolution of the input. It is always possible to reconstruct the initial state by observing the evolution of the output. And you can check those um, two conditions mathematically uh, by computing uh, the rank of some uh, combination of those ABC matrices. There's also a function in Dynea that can get you the minimal state space system. It's called get, get minimal state representation. Typically what you get in this GHX and GHU is typically not the minimal state vector, but includes redundant or endogenous state variables. But very importantly, the minimal state representation is only unique up to rotation. So typically the numerical procedures will give you some numerical state matrices, um, but they don't really correspond to state variables that have a clear economic meaning. Now, Kovinger and Eng have provided the mathematical background to establish the, the rank conditions from the control theory back in the 60s to modern DSGE models. And they look at so-called similarity transformation matrices, this T and U here, of the minimal state uh, matrices A, B, C, D and sigma U. And they establish here that uniqueness requires that these matrices um, I only have a unique A here given some parameter theta one and a unique A here given some parameter theta zero only if this T matrix is the identity matrix and the same for the U matrix, okay? I want this to be the identity matrix. So this is the point I'm concerned about. Now I can establish exactly a Jacobian matrix at this point for this mapping um, can establish a proposition that theta is locally identifiability at this point theta zero, zero if and only if this matrix over here has full column rank. Okay, so what is the intuition here? Well, this is based on uh, results, uh, well-established results from control theory for minimal systems. So, and in a sense it, uh, like right here, this is si similar to what we do with the reduced form analysis. Okay, how do these matrices change when I change my parameters? But also we consider more, that is restrictions for observational equivalent model dynamics without actually computing the, the autocovariances or the spectral density. And those restrictions arise because, say for a given shock size, um, each transfer function is potentially obtained from a multitude of quadruples A, B, C and D. Or there are many pairs of sigma and transfer function combinations that will give you the exact same spectral density. And these two intuitions, ideas, correspond basically to these two columns here. 
So they give you some sort of idea on the dynamic properties of your model. Anyways, we do get this rank condition that we can check and pinpoint the parameters that are responsible for non-identification, but we also get an order condition um, that the number of parameters needs to be greater than the rows of this matrix. So now let's have a look at Dynair's implementation of the local identification checks. So the toolbox is simply called by inserting the keyword identification in your mode file. Internally, this triggers several additional uh, preprocessing steps like computing additional symbolic computations. Um, this is all done by the preprocessor. This then calls a MATLAB function called Dynair underscore identification, which performs all the identification analysis. The toolbox has two modes of operation. First, by default, um, we do point identification, where you choose the, the theta zero uh, you want to check identification for. So usually you're interested in the calibrated values, uh, but also you can choose the prior mean or mode or the posterior mean or posterior mode. Now there's another mode whenever you insert the option prior underscore MC equals to some number, then we trigger a Monte Carlo mode. This means that we randomly draw parameters from the admissible parameter space, so ensuring stability and determinacy, and then computing the point identification checks on each of these draws. By default, um, all declared model parameters as well as all standard errors of the shocks are checked. If you want to focus on a certain subset of parameters, then you need to provide an estimated params block. So you can then either simply include initial values or a whole prior uh, information, which is actually useful if you're doing a, the Monte Carlo mode because then we draw from the prior domain. If you include a prior, the identification check is done at the prior mean by default. Now, some disclaimers, some warnings um, here. Please try to use best practices in your mode file because this is very important um, for the preprocessor and the identification toolbox to compute the Jacobians precisely. For instance, sometimes we have parameters that are updated in a uh, self-written uh, steady state file. And for the preprocessor, this is of course somewhat hidden and we can't compute analytical derivatives in this case anymore. We have some checks and warnings and some options are changed in this uh, cases. Um, but anyways, for at least for computational speed, it is always better to write uh, a steady state model block, possibly with some helper function, as this greatly improves performance. Also, as we have seen, for instance, with the slope of the new Keynesian Phillips curve or the, the discount factor in my investment adjustment cost example, um, we sometimes have composite parameters, so they are dependent on other structural parameters. So don't declare all of these parameters, okay? But use um, model local variables in a clever way, uh, so those variables with a hashtag um, in the model block. Actually, the identification toolbox will, in most cases, catch these, but in some cases you might get very weird results. And particularly if you then go ahead and try to estimate your model, you will get some weird results because the optimizer is having a hard time updating all those parameters simultaneously because it doesn't know that they are dependent on each other. So this is not good. Okay, so use model local variables in your model block. Now, when the toolbox finds non-singularity of a Jacobian, we have several routines uh, trying to pinpoint the parameters uh, responsible for this. So first, the ranks are computed using the singular value decomposition. And there are several options to fine tune, uh, for instance, the tolerance levels, and, and you might want to change this in your model. Then if we find columns of zeros, we print the parameter corresponding to this column to the console. Also, we compute pairwise and even multi-correlation coefficients of each column. Uh, and if there is some perfect linear dependence, um, these parameters are also printed to the command window as well. Alternatively, there's a, an option to redo all the identification checks for, for all possible combinations of parameters and simply check the rank without looking into the null space. The method is uh, more robust, but it takes much longer. Now, let's have a closer look at the different modes of operation. So let's consider again the investment adjustment cost example. Um, I'm using an estimated params block to really focus on these parameters here, okay? 
So um, for instance, I have a sig A here, which is the scale for the standard deviation of a TFP shock. So if you have a look into my model equations, I'm multiplying sig A times EPS A. Okay, and I'm with the estimated params block, I want to focus identification of these parameters, but I'm not checking the standard error of the um, of EPS A. I could do that though. Let's do this. Okay, let's see what happens if we just do the local identification analysis. With parameter set, I can tell Dynair which values to use. So calibration is then the current values. I could also do prior mean or prior mode. Uh, if you have a posterior available, you can also do posterior mean or posterior mode. Okay, let's do it. Okay, let's have a look in the console here. So identification analysis, it will tell you which parameter set is chosen. Um, it needs to do something to evaluate the information matrix to compute the strength. We, we get do get some pictures here. We will talk about this in a second. And then it tells you which our numerical options are chosen. So we, we're computing the Jacobians analytically. We're using the null speed and multi-correlation coefficients to find problematic parameters. Uh, we even normalize the Jacobians. Um, and then those are the tolerance levels used to compute the rank in with the singular value decomposition. Now, the reduced form message here is the Jacobian of tau, okay? And it finds a column of zero for RA and two columns that are perfectly linear dependent in the reduced form. This is uh, the sig A and the standard error of A. Okay, again, I put this in on purpose to, to tell you because in, at, in the linear model, this is actually scaling the standard error of epsilon. So there is no way to distinguish this sig A from the standard error I've declared here. Now, looking into the other three criteria, the minimal system criteria, or the, sp the one based on the spectrum, or the one based on moments, all tell you, uh, in addition to those two here, that also kappa and theta are pairwise collinear, so there are, so there are columns that are perfectly linear dependent. Okay, now let's do a Monte Carlo mode. Okay, so, and this can be triggered by simply adding the option prior MC to some number. In practice, you should be, uh, you should do a very high number, so at least uh, 300, 500, or even a thousand draws. So it first does the local identification check and then you get the MC identification checks. Okay, let's have a look at the console. So what changes? Well, first you have the local, the local point identification checks, which are the same, but then we're doing the MC sample here. And it simply tells you in how many cases it finds which failure of identification. And you can see that those that those identification failures actually are not only for the one calibration I've given you, but also for at least 20 other calibrations. Now what happens if I'm if I fix so this sig A, I don't want to check identification of that. And if I fix theta, let's do this again. Okay, we can see it that the point identification only found RA, and so does the Monte Carlo mode as well. Okay, so if you have this perfect collinearity, you need to fix one of these parameters. Okay, maybe some computational remarks. There are many options for the um, algorithm used in this toolbox, so please have a look at the manual. Some are relevant for all checks, some are test specific. So the key issue here is to di distinguish near linear dependence, which is a rather a sign of weak identification from true perfect collinearity. And whenever possible, the code uses closed form expressions to compute Jacobians analytically. So which is basically based on a function get perturbation parameters that computes the parameter Jacobians of the perturbation solution in closed form and analytically. And this is then used to compute the Jacobians of 
the reduced form or the moments or the spectrum or the uh, minimal system analytically as well. And this is important because there are severe errors of, of numerical differentiation techniques. So computing ranks, for instance, is much more sensitive to the tolerance levels chosen not only for the rank computation, but in particular for computing numerical derivatives. We also normalize the Jacobians, which facilitates the rank computations in most cases, but not in all. So you might want to check out this option to turn this normalization off, in particular for the spectrum test. Okay, now we've seen some checks on the lack of identification and what about the strength of identification? Uh, how precise can you estimate your parameters? So we're talking about weak identification. And the intuition again here is, even though that all parameters enter the objective separately and the objective has a unique maximum or minimum, its curvature might be small in a certain region of the parameter space, and particularly in small sample sizes. And I will talk about two diagnostics you can use here, which are based on this idea of measuring the precision of the parameter estimate, that is the inverse of the variance of a parameter estimate. So first one is based on the Fisher information matrix and this one is computed automatically in Dynair's toolbox. And the second one is a Bayesian simulation approach, which you need to do uh, by hand. Uh, this is not yet included, but will be soon uh, in Dynair's toolbox. Now let's first have a look at, at the information matrix approach. The precision of the parameter estimates at the mode is given theoretically and asymptotically by the inverse of the Fisher information matrix, okay, which is based on the second order parameter derivatives of your objective uh, of your likelihood function. And typically we want this to also be non-singular. Otherwise you don't have any curvature in your likelihood. Okay, so if a parameter is not identified, you have a flat likelihood um, with respect to this parameter. Now let us decompose this Fisher Info matrix matrix into two parts. So first a variance matrix, that is this capital delta here, that is the diagonal of the information matrix. And the correlation part that I denote with a tilde here. And you can use matrix decomposition techniques to get these objects. Now, again, there are two reasons for non-identifiability. So first, the likelihood does not change when the parameter theta i changes. Okay, so this corresponds that the variance part with respect to this parameter will be zero. Second, the effect on the likelihood is offset due to perfect correlation to other parameters. So the correlation part will be exactly one. And now for weak identification, we can use this insight because in cases when either the variance part is very close to zero or the correlation part is very close to one, then we have weak identification. So this is the intuition behind measuring the identification strength via the information matrix. Now, more formally, um, this is based on the gamma rao lower bound of the uncertainty of an unbiased estimate. So no estimate of the standard error of an unbiased estimator will be lower as this bound. And this bound can be computed or is actually equal to the inverse of the Fisher information matrix. And Anderle has proposed to measure the strength on the square root of the product of this variance part times one minus the correlation part squared. So this is simply using our decomposition of the information matrix to set up a strength measure here. And this precision measure uses a theoretical object. We don't need any data to compute it. But it also has a nice interpretation in the sense that this is a lower bound on the estimation uncertainty in an unbiased finite sample estimator. We do have a problem though. Um, this measure is not unit free. And one solution we do in Dynair is to multiply by the value of the parameter to get a renormalized version of the curvature. So this can be so somewhat interpreted maybe as a a priori t-test um, and also taking the square here of theta uh, or theta i assures that this is positive. So on the other hand, we have also the sensitivity component that we also multiply by the value. Um, and the sensitivity component contained in this measure is the 
elasticity of the likelihood function with respect to theta i, keeping all other parameters constant. Okay, so basically the idea here in Dynea is what, what we do is we normalize by multiplying by the value of the parameter itself. There's another problem. What if this parameter is actually zero? So multiplying by zero is not a good idea. So in this case, we by default also consider another alternative normalization because often we have prior information on the parameters. So the idea here is to consider a renormalized version where we multiply by the prior standard deviation to get this strength component and also the sensitivity component. Now having these two measures, we plot these by default when running identification. So again, what are the strength and the sensitivity components? So we have those two things. The strength component measures the strength of identification. So here the idea is whether or not this variance part is close to zero or the correlation part is close to one. And if, they are, if the variance part is close to zero and the correlation or the correlation part is close to one, then we have weak identification and this measure will be very close to zero. For strongly identified parameters, it will be non-zero. The other measure, the sensitivity one, is well, we keep all other parameters constant and this answers you, is there any curvature in the likelihood for this individual parameter? So does it enter the likelihood at all? Is there any curvature in the likelihood for this parameter, keeping all other parameters constant? Maybe some um, remarks about computing the information matrix. Um, there are ways to do this analytically under some assumptions um, and some model variants. And whenever possible, we do this in Dynair. Okay, so this is done automatically. However, in some cases, for instance, if you have stochastic singularity or something goes wrong with the asymptotic information matrix computations, we rely on simulations to compute an estimate of it. And we call this moment information matrix. Okay, because we basically perform several simulations, we then compute sample moments of observed data and then take the covariance matrix of uh, these simulated moments. And multiplying this with the parameter Jacobian of the moments is then what we call the moment information or the simulated moment information matrix. This is an estimate of the asymptotic information matrix. It's of, it's of course theoretically and practically not the Kramer lower bound. Now let's have a look at those plots. So let us consider the investment adjustment cost model um, and let's run the prior MC equals 20 example here again because it does both the point mode but also the Monte Carlo mode, okay? So this actually tells you that simulated moment uncertainty is computed because we have stochastic singularity in this model. There's only one shock, but we assume that two variables are observable. Now, when you do the point identification mode, you have this picture. So in the upper part, we compute this identification, identification strength part. It will tell you whether or not it uses the moments information ma matrix or the asymptotic information matrix. And below you have the sensitivity component. So whether or not this parameter actually provides some curvature to the likelihood keeping all other parameters constant. Okay, so having a look here at the sensitivity part, keeping all other parameters constant, all parameters do have an impact on the likelihood except RA, because this has only an effect on the calibration of beta, but not on any model dynamics here. Now the identification strength measures whether or not this variance part is close to zero or the correlation part is close to one, and then this measure will be very low. So you can see that those parameters, they are, cannot be strongly identified. These can be strongly identified. And here, um, this depends on whether or not you consider how the normalization whether it is rel relative to the parameter value, okay, or whether this is relative to the prior standard deviation. Okay, so this is the red part. If there is a white circle, then this means the multiplication is done with zero and we cannot compute this value. Okay, we see that, of course, these are theoretically not identified and so their strength is also zero. Um, if you do the Monte Carlo 
option, then you get another picture and this is basically the mean of the sensitivity measure. So you computed 20 sensitivity measures and this gives you the mean of those sensitivity measures. Okay, and so we, if we fix, say, theta, then we would see that there is information or we can identify kappa actually quite strongly. Okay, now let me talk about another way to assess the strength of identification using a Bayesian learning rate indicator. So this is based on the idea that the identification strength should become better as more data becomes available. Uh, and as more data becomes available, the idea here is that parameters can be estimated more precisely. And with an infinite amount of data, the Bayesian approach is actually equivalent to the maximum likelihood approach. And Cooper, Saron and Smith used this to develop an indicator based on the rate the precision estimate of a parameter updates. So ideally, let's double the data and the precision of my estimate should also double. Now let's suppose there are two parameters, uh, theta2 that are well identified and other parameters, theta1, that are weakly identified. So there is some curvature, but not very much. Now for a growing sample size, we have that the posterior precision of theta1 divided by t uh, by the sample size divided by the sample size will go to zero because the speed the sample size increases is faster than the increase in the precision. On the other hand, for our well-identified parameters, the posterior precision of theta2 divided by the sample size will go to a constant because both speeds increase at the same rate. So this is a Bayesian simulation approach you can easily perform in Dynair. I am in the process of including this as an option to the identification toolbox. For now, you have to do this manually. How do you do that? Uh, well, simply simulate a large data set and estimate with Bayesian MCMC methods, first on a sample size, say, of 100 observations, then 300, 900, 2,000, and 700 observations. So, like, triple your, uh, your sample size or double it, whatever you feel like. Then compute the average posterior precision, that is the posterior precision divided by the sample size. You can also compute it by the product of the posterior variance times t and then take the inverse of that. Um, that's uh, up to you. Another way to compute this indicator is to compute so-called convergence ratios. That is the ratio of two subsequent estimated posterior precision values, for instance at t uh, equals 100 and t equals 300 and check whether this ratio is close to the rate at which t increases, that is 3 in this case. Now which Bayesian MCMC estimation technique you use um, is, uh, is not important actually, but like to make this an automatic indicator and a quick indicator, um, ideally it has to be quick and, not, and without much fine tuning. And what I find and what I want to implement uh, in the toolbox is that the slice sampler works pretty well in this case. It requires almost no fine tuning. Um, I don't need to find the mode, for instance, uh, as, an, as I would do to initialize a random walk Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And also you can definitely speed this up by using the parallel option of Dynair. So that is if you have, say, eight cores in your computer, why not run one or two chains on each core? So for the investment adjustment costs model, I've done this in a recent paper. Uh, you can get the replication codes on GitHub here. I declared beta as a model local variable, so I'm able to estimate RA. But on purpose, we estimated the model here without removing the theoretical lack of identification of theta and kappa. And this is not a good idea. This made estimation quite hard particularly mode finding exercises. But now let's have a look at the average precision. Um, we see that those average precisions here, they do tend to zero. Okay, so they become lower and lower except for row A. So in this table, you can judge that row A is strongly identified, all other parameters are weakly identified. And the same picture is of course, if we uh, look at the convergence ratios. So here you basically see that I'm tripling the sample sizes, so I want these values to go to 3. And for row A, they go, do go to 3, and all other variables stay at uh, close to 1. 
So these are weakly identified, this is strongly identified, this is weakly identified. Okay, these two tables contain exactly the same information. This is just a matter of presentation. Now, when I, however, fix the theoretical lack of identification by, for instance, fixing kappa, uh, we find that the only parameter that is weakly identified is RA. Okay, and this is a common finding in the real business cycle literature that estimating the discount factor is very hard. But all other parameters are strongly identified. Estimating models with non-identified parameters will give you severe problems in the estimation of other actually well-identified parameters. Um, here we do not fix uh, either theta or kappa, but if we do, then the estimation procedures run smoothly. I do get well-behaved posteriors and actually strongly identified parameters. So fixing theoretical lack of identification is also important from a Bayesian point of view. Let's have a look at the advanced option of the identification toolbox. So when running in point mode, we get a an additional analysis of the linear rational expectations form, that is the steady state and the dynamic model derivatives for all model variables. And we also compute the Jacobian with respect to parameters of these objects. Moreover, we get a different sensitivity measure that is, that is based on the norm of the columns in the Jacobians. And also we analyze identification patterns by running either regressions or looking at singular value decompositions. So let me give you a bit more information here on the sensitivity me measure. The question here is how do changes in the elements of theta impact the model moments, the reduced form solution and the dynamic model. So there could be two things, either different parameter uncertainty by uh, ascribing more importance to variable parameters or differently volatile moment solution matrices or dynamic Jacobians. And we can measure this compactly um, by looking at the Jacobian, do some certain normalizations, and then have a look at the columns and do a norm of these columns. And we get a single aggregate sensitivity measure over all moments, solution matrices, or dynamic model Jacobians for each parameter. What about analyzing identification patterns? Um, basically, the advanced option does two things. Um, one, we check which group of one, two, or more parameters is most capable to mimic or replace the effect of each parameter. So here I'm looking again at the correlation component of the columns in the Jacobian to see whether there might be perfect collinearity or near perfect collinearity. And we do this by brute force. For each single parameter, a set of regressions is run on the column of the Jacobian corresponding to this parameter and on all possible combinations of other Jacobian columns. And finding the column and thus parameter combination with the highest determination coefficient R square indicates near or perfect collinearity. Now the second approach here is based on the idea to judge identification from a singular value decomposition of the information matrix. And the option provides the size of the singular values and the associated eigenvectors. And those correspond to the parameters. And parameter combinations associated with the smallest singular values are closest to being perfectly collinear and thus redundant. In the limit, a singular value of zero implies that the parameters, that the parameter or the parameter combinations is completely unidentified, as this is responsible for the information matrix being rank deficient. If a matrix is rank deficient, we get very, very small singular values, and then we look at those eigenvectors to pinpoint the parameters responsible for this. So let's have a look in Dynair how this works. So basically all you have to do is to include advanced equals one. So let's first do this in point mode. Okay, let's first have a look at those pictures. The first one, we've already discussed this. The second one is this different sensitivity measure. Okay, so the norm of the columns of the Jacobian of moments of the reduced form that is model or the linear rational expectation. And this is a log scale. So negative values are actually almost zero, okay? And we can see that for our totally unidentified parameter, our endogenous parameter here, RA, there is no sensitivity at all. So this parameter does not influence neither the moments nor the model nor the linear rational expectation model. 
and for those unidentified here the linear rational expectations model is not influenced at all but there is some influence on the moments and on the reduced form. Again this is a sensitivity measure keeping all other parameters constant. For the other parameters we do see that those influence both the moments but also the reduced form and also the linear rational expectations model. So here's the plot of collinearity patterns. So which linear combination of parameters shown in the columns here best replicates the effect of the parameter in the row. So is explained by. And very high values, so very high, for instance one here, theta is best explained by kappa and kappa is best explained by theta. This implies weak identification. Now we can do this with one parameter. By default we also do this with two parameters. Again you can see for theta and kappa that this is dark red and for the other ones we do see that this is not really dark red but uh, almost dark red. So, the my, so alpha, the effect of alpha might be replicated by the effect of delta and um, ra here as well. Then identification patterns are also given by the singular values of the information matrix. Okay, and here first we have a look at the smallest singular value. So a singular value of zero indicates that the, correspond the eigenvectors corresponding to the parameters are totally redundant. They are totally non-identified. We can see this with RA. And if this Jaco Jacobian of the moments information matrix is singular, so it is not full rank, then very small singular values and the corresponding eigenvectors indicate which parameters are responsible for that. So for instance, here you can see this is theta and kappa for this very small value. And the other singular values are actually large, okay? So they're not close to zero. We also see the largest singular values. So let's have a look at what happens in the console. Okay, now we've talked about this over here. Those heat maps that you saw, the values that are plotted are given here as well in the console and dark red corresponds to a value of one and this is basically the multi-correlation coefficients here. And I would not really bother about unless this coefficient is really, really close to one. So 0 0.99 or 98, something like that. But 97 is pretty fine. Now the same collinearity patterns with two parameters. Okay, so the only problem we get is again with theta and kappa. Now let's do the advanced option in Monte Carlo mode of operation. Here we compute condition numbers of the Jacobians of moments, reduced form and linear rational expectations model. And we de detect parameters that drive large condition numbers. And those large condition numbers indicate weak identification. Uh, we also provide some detail point estimates of the parameters that have the smallest and the largest condition number. So these are key. And we do the analysis of identification patterns across the Monte Carlo sample. So let's have a look at this in the Dynair code. Now let's include the advance equals one option and let's run this to see what additional output we get. We have seen all these pictures, so I can close them. Okay, now let us first have a look at the plots. Here you can see an overview over the 20 samples that I've drawn about condition numbers. Uh, a condition number is the ratio of the largest singular value to the smallest singular value. And large condition numbers imply a nearly singular matrix that is indication of weak identifiability. So these pictures basically give you an overview of the strength of identification over the parameter range in the Monte Carlo. And they do this for the Jacobian on the reduced form. Uh, the Jacobian of moments and the Jacobian of the linear rational expectation model. So having a look here, large condition numbers indicate weak identification and you have many, many draws. So this is actually plotting the log of the condition number. So you have many draws where you are faced with a model that is weakly identified in the moments. 
Okay, maybe not so much in the linear rational expectation model. The, they are all rather here, but this really indicates something's wrong with your model. Of course, theta and kappa, and you have this RA in the model. Now we have three pictures, again, for the Jacobian of the linear, linear rational expectation model or the Jacobian of the model solution, that, that is the reduced form model, or the moments. And here we basically divide our Monte Carlo sample into two sets. So one where the condition number is above the median and one where the condition number is below the median. So this is high condition number versus low condition number. And then we do a Smirnov test whether those distributions are actually equal to each other. And for if the p-value of that test is below 0.1, then we plot distributions in these graphs here. And the idea is to have a look whether these distributions differ, okay? And if yes, then this parameter is the source of the Jacobian being singular. Of course, in the model moments, you have this theoretical non-identification in all of your draws. So those won't differ here. And the only difference arises from the delta. Next, we perform analysis on the singular value across the Monte Carlo sample. So we have a look at the mean here. And here you can clearly see that with the lowest mean singular value, there's always those eigenvectors corresponding to theta and kappa and to Ra and also just to Ra very strongly and a bit to theta and kappa here. Those are the highest singular value. Again, the lowest singular value are most interesting here in finding non-identified or weakly identified parameters. Now let's have a look in the console. So we've already seen what is happening here. Okay. Now displaying advanced diagnostics in Monte Carlo mode. Here we have the Smirnov tests. So dividing the, the sample here into low condition numbers and high condition numbers. Um, the division is taking place at the medium here of the condition numbers. We know that high condition numbers imply a near singular matrix. Okay, so this is the division of the samples. The Smirnov test compares whether those distributions are being equal. And if the p-value is uh, above one, then it plots these distributions for these values. All right. Up to now, we only considered a linearized Gaussian DSG model. And that is fine because all the information that we can use for identification and ultimately also for estimation is contained in the first two moments of data only or in the spectral density of the data. And we've seen several identification problems, right? We have that different parameter values yield the exact same moments or the exact same spectral density and the exact same model dynamics. Some parameters drop out from the solution. Other parameters are collinear. And of course, estimation of an unidentified uh, model cannot succeed in principle. And this will lead to wrong conclusion from inference and wrong policy advice. So um, I have indicated how one can try and solve these issues by, say, considering the effect of different observables, functional specifications, model features, and shocks. And this has an effect both on the theoretical lack of identification, but also on the strength of identification in linearized models. And the basic punchline here is, again, identification is a model property. Slight changes to your model do have a measurable effect on the identifiability and estimability of your parameters. But now in this part, I want to show you another approach. That is, let me deviate from the linearity assumption and maybe also from the Gaussianity assumption. Um, here, the basic idea is there might be more information, more restrictions found in higher order statistics, higher order moments, higher order spectra that can be used to identify model parameters and of course to estimate them more precisely. And Daniel's identification toolbox contains similar diagnostics to the linear case that we've just seen, um, but for also for DSG models solved with higher order perturbation approximation, but this requires the pruning option. Now, let me give you a bit of a framework here. So Daniel's very general model framework is that we can put any model into one where we have one lag and one lead on the endogenous variables and we have our exogenous variables here and a bunch of parameters. And the solution to such models is finding a policy function g so, so that given a state of the world yesterday and today's shocks, 
the agents behave optimally and we have a rule, a decision rule, a policy function for all the endogenous variables. Now, typically we don't have this function in closed form, we need to approximate it. And in Dynea, we use perturbation for this. So this is basically a Taylor approximation around the non-stochastic steady state. So this will look something like this. A first order approximation, you only get this here, this terms here. At the second order approximation, you get additionally these terms and maybe a third and fourth or fifth order approximation. You can do that with Dynair. Now the idea of perturbation solution, how do I get this matrices, this GX and GXU and stuff like that? Well, I do get this from Taylor approximations of my original model equations, evaluating these at the steady state and then do some manipulation to the equations to get the Taylor approximations of my policy functions around the non-stochastic steady state. However, there is one little problem that we often encounter in higher order approximations. So that is at second, at third, at fourth order. There is the possibility of explosive behavior in those higher order approximations. So even though at first order your model is uh, stationary and ergodic, at higher orders there might be shocks that, that impact your model such that it does not return to steady state, it explodes. One solution to this problem is called pruning. And the idea here is to leave out terms in the solution, in the perturbation solution, that have higher order effects than the approximation order. And there are some literature references here that show that the prune state space system is stationary and ergodic. And also pruning, even though it seems like an ad hoc procedure, it can be shown that this is a valid approximation of the policy functions in the perturbation parameter. So let me give you a univariate example. So let's consider um, a second order, just one equation, one state variable, and the second order approximated system will look like this. Okay, at first order, this condition here is sufficient that this will be stable at first order. And second order, I get this additional term over here. Now, this model or this equation has two fixed points. Our original steady state, which is also the steady state of the second order approximated system. But at second order, I can also plug in this here, and this is also a so-called fixed point. And now assume you have a shock, you start out at zero, and you have a, a shock that is large enough that you pass this value over here. Uh, then you will see that the system does not return to the steady state, it explodes. Okay, so this is the problem of higher order approximations. Now, what is the idea of pruning? Um, so let us decompose this state vectors here into so-called first and second order effects. Okay, so this is an artificial decomposition. Okay, so these, this x, let's assume there is a first order effect and a second order effect. And let's simply use the law of motion at second order. So insert xf and xs wherever you had x in the previous slide and you will get something like this here. And here you can see that this is a first order effect, this is a second order effect, this is a first order effect squared, so a second order effect, and this is a third order effect here, and this is actually a fourth order effect. And the idea now of pruning is, prune those terms that contain third order effects or, or fourth order effects, because we only approximate it at second order. And then we get those law of motions for first order effects, this law of motion here for second order effects, and also for my squared matrix over here, I get this law of motion. So having those three law of motions, I can then write them down as matrices. So XTF, XTS, and XTF squared, and see that here I have a vector of the same variables, but at T minus one. Okay, and the corresponding matrix here um, has gx, gx, and gx squared, and we know that gx less than one. So this matrix is a stable matrix, okay? So all the eigenvalues lie inside the unit circle. So this is already a stable system. And then I have here a shocks vector. So there's some u, but there's also some multiplication with xf. And to get this vector to have mean zero, I need to subtract and add a term here, but this is just a constant. Okay, and what I have is 
zt equals a times zt minus 1 plus b times a shock vector plus some constant. This is a linear state space system. And it's actually stable because stability is governed by the first order approximation. We can establish a proposition that given such an extended state vector and an extended vector of innovations, um, the pruned perturbation solution of a DSG model can always be rewritten as a linear time invariant state space system for any approximation order. It will have this form. Okay, so this is the extended state vector and this is either your all your endogenous variables or just the observable variables. Okay, so this will look like this. Note though that even your u is Gaussian, this extended shock vector is non-Gaussian. And this is very handy because having non-Gaussianity here in this extended state vector will actually have an influence on the uh, moments of my variables, okay? And I can even consider higher order moments as well. So higher order statistics may contain additional information for estimation and identification. Having this linear state space system, it is straightforward but very tedious to compute moments or cumulants or poly spectra. Cumulants are basically um, the same as product moments but are mathematically easier to handle. And poly spectra are basically uh, if you transform the third order product moments into the frequency domain then you get the bi spectrum. If you transform the fourth order moments into the uh, frequency domain then you get the tri spectrum and, and so on. So this is, uh, this is a generalization of the spectral density. Now, what about identification diagnostics for nonlinear DSG models? Well, we can use very similar diagnostic based on moments or the spectrum to detect local identification issues. So what we basically do is we compute those moments from the prune state space system. Not from the linearized Gaussian state space system, but from the linear prune state space system. Uh, we could actually also use higher order statistics and poly spectra, but this is not yet implemented in Dynair. Now, what about identification strength? Well, basically, we don't have an expression for the asymptotic information matrix because this extended innovations vector is non Gaussian anymore. So, this is not available analytically, but using the simulated information matrix approach by simulating from the prune state space uh, gives us mean to also compute this identification strength diagnostic. You could also do a the Bayesian learning rate indicator. It is conceptually available. However, you need to use either a nonlinear Kalman filter or a particle filter to evaluate the likelihood. Okay, now let's have a look in Dynair. This is very easy to do. You simply put in order equals two, then let's call this second order. This will take a little longer. Okay. Okay, so the output in the terminal here, um, RA is still not identified, of course, but theta and kappa are identifiers both for the moments test, the spectrum test, and also the minimal system test. The minimal system test is actually based on the first order minimal state space system, but it includes second order accurate first moments. Okay, so you, here you have an indication that restrictions needed to identify theta and kappa separately actually come from the mean. Okay, and this holds even for 20 draws from the prior domain. In all cases, theta and kappa become identified. Now, what you can see is that so for kappa, the identification is all right. For theta, might be a bit weak. Okay, so the mean of the sensitivity measure is the same here. Okay, now let me conclude. So, we have seen how to detect identification issues and what can happen and how to use Dynair's identification toolbox. Um, it's always good practice to fix those obvious identification failures that the toolbox tells you to fix. So calibrate or re-parameterize your model to get rid of those. Um, you can use all the tools available in the toolbox to, to get insight in the identification properties of your model. And 
identification itself becomes a model property, okay? It depends on the choice uh, you make uh, in your model, on the choice of observables, on functional specifications, on model features, and also on the choice of structural sh shocks. So for instance, the investment adjustment cost model at first order, the linearized one, could also be identified by uh, using a different functional specification for intertemporal adjustment costs based on investment growth, for instance. Or we could add capital utilization to the model and this would also solve the identification problem. Or we could use an investment specific technological shock. Um, or lastly, you could even include labor. This also solves these, this identification problem that I cannot distinguish those two types of investment adjustment costs. Now, um, let me finish with some personal experience here. Um, the identification toolbox is very useful to find those obvious identification failures and, you can, and you, you can and you should definitely fix this. After fixing this, what's, what I have seen is that larger models actually tend to be theoretically identified, but they do suffer from weak identification. And there are estimation methods that are robust to weak identification. I've given you here some uh, literature references. Um, like you could also find that even though your parameters are weakly identified, the uh, bands you get for, say, for your impulse response functions are actually quite narrow. So it all depends what you want to study here. Um, and also these, this nonlinear or non-Gaussian approach might enrich identifiability and model dynamics, but of course comes at a price because you have to deal with non-linearly solving your model and also estimating the non-linearly solved model.